So here we are at the panel on um, open source and education and its effect on diversity and inclusion. And I'm really excited to be doing this panel today. I'm Denise Cooper. I am the vice president of special initiatives for a company called Nearform Limited in Ireland. And uh, about 22 years now into uh, open source activism uh, of all stripes. So that's my, my gig. Um, so Heidi. I'm Heidi Ellis, and I am a professor at Western New England University, and I first got started in open source about 2006, that area. And Greg? I'm Greg Hislop. I'm a faculty member professor at uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia, and uh, I've been doing open source for a similar amount of time as Heidi. We, we sort of started on it together. I'm That's Ellen. great. Go ahead, I'm, Ellen. Thanks. I'm Ellen Spurtis. I'm a computer science professor at Mills College, and I've been involved in open source for about 20 years. And that's Mills College in Oakland. Yep, Oakland, California, in the Bay Area. Nice. I'm in San Francisco right now. So Me too. There you go. Great. All right. Well, um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about what we've been involved in. I'm actually gonna set an alarm, um, but that probably won't go off because people tend to go under, but I'm giving each of us five minutes to say our piece. And I am going to be very happy to start with uh, Ellen. Go, you go first, Ellen. Thank you. Um, Mills is a uh, minority serving women's college. We also have graduate programs open to people of any sex. One is a unique program for people who got a bachelor's degree in a different field and want to go into computer science. So this is addressing the pipeline problem. And that uh, gives a problem slash opportunity. We have to take our undergraduate classes and make them dual level. So there's uh, additional depth for graduate students. And one way I've done that is by having the graduate students and programming projects contribute to open source projects. And uh, in order to do that, I teach them and sometimes the other students skills that they need, such as how to use the command line, um, how to use Git and GitHub. Sometimes they have to learn additional build tools and uh, development environments. And I help the students pick out projects to work on and issues within those projects. It's important to find projects where um, outsiders are welcome, where they'll be treated well, where uh, the, their questions will be answered, their PRs, their pull requests will get reviewed. Um, it can be difficult to pick out an issue um, you don't want an issue that's too important that you won't be working fast enough, but you also want to do something that's valuable. Um, I just gave a, a whole talk on this topic. Um, the students have contributed to App Inventor, which um, I worked on, and um, to other apps, um, Habitica, which they use, and we're currently working on Minecraft plugins, which students are excited about. Um, the most important support I think I provide to the students, and the technical support is important, but something that may uh, be underappreciated is the um, psychological and communication support. Um, the students feel scared to um, approach the maintainers of the project. They don't know how they'll be treated um, if they post to a forum asking for help. So letting students know that it's normal to feel overwhelmed and talking about times when I felt overwhelmed, um, that's very helpful to them. Letting them know when they should keep working on something versus asking me for help or asking uh, the maintainers or developer community for help. 
and looking over messages from them before they post them to Stack Overflow, Discord, um, GitHub. That's something that's help that they find helpful. Students also sometimes work on open source projects for their master's theses. And that's nice because um, they're writing code that people will use and they learn so much by working on real projects rather than creating something from scratch. That's great. Yeah, that's all really, really interesting. And um, thank you for doing all of that. It's, uh, it's I, I noticed that some of the projects that you're sending people to are ones that you have some control over because you created them. And that's really smart, I think. Um, I've been involved in with Johns Hopkins University, which just this year started their first uh, Institute for Applied Open Source at a major research institution. And they are showcasing seven things they invented and giving that that is what they're going to be driving students to work on instead of trying to get into one of the classical open source projects, because as we know, that's not so easy to do in the space of a semester. And they're going to call that project semesters of code. Okay, next, Who, who's feeling strongly about being next? Heidi, you look like you're ready. Go for it. I can go. So, um, so I'm currently at Western New England University and, but I've been, um, I started looking at free and open source software in 2006 and I was at Trinity College where Ralph Morelli actually started pulling using App Inventor for trying uh -huh. to create socially relevant projects. So right. I was there when he started that effort and nice. the HFOS effort. So I got, when I first started in 2006, I, I quickly realized that um, the community, that open source communities were wonderful places with lots of potential for student learning, right? That, that there was lots of potential there. and. We found that this, the, the projects that tended to have some um, social awareness or, or idea of social benefit tended to have altruistic feelings within their communities. And so they were welcoming for students. They were forgiving of student mistakes and trip ups and things. And so, um, and we did some early research and got some early evidence that projects with some social benefit have the potential to attract women and members of the underrepresented groups. And so that started us sort of on the way of into the path of how do you do this with students? Um, recognizing that most academic institutions don't teach open source. Most students don't get taught any of this. If they, if they get GitHub, they use it to like store their resume and they don't understand versioning. They just stick it out there. <laughs> right. So, and part of what, when we come to ATO, what we want to be able to do is get that message across to the open source communities that, that students really are not aware of open source in so many ways and can to talk about ways we can create pipelines that will connect those two. Okay. Um, so, over since 2006, I've had students involved with a variety of open source projects. We've done um, uh, Ushahidi and OpenMRS and worked with Sahana. Sahana is where I started. I had students for several years making contributions to GNOME accessibility, Mozilla, Mozilla accessibility, all related to somehow um, helping people. Okay. <laughs> About three years ago, there became sort of a widening rec recognition across members of our research group, which now is up to about 13 people in about 10 different institutions, um, that there was some significant food insecurity on campus. And mm -hmm. so we started an effort that we're calling Libre Food Pantry. And right now it has three projects within it for three different institutions trying to support, build software to support our local food pantries. Um, ours happens to be called Bear Necessities Market because our um, uh, mascot is a Kodiak bear. So we have the Bear Necessities Market. Um, and what we're trying to do is use that library food pantry as a way to educate. So we started with the typical seniors capstone project um, but what we've been doing is introducing it now down into the freshman and sophomore levels so that the learning curve is somewhat abated so that they have some understanding of the project and the culture by the time they hit that senior, that senior level. So 
most recently, we just just got news that we got um, an additional five years of National Science Foundation funding to, to spend more time looking at the impact of the social benefit of open source projects. And so we're just starting to kick that off and we're really excited. Um, some of the other things that we're looking at in that, in that effort, um, what we've noticed is that participation in open source, faculty members that have participated in open source and gotten students participated in open source, report changes in their teaching. Mm -hmm. So they talk about them, they talk about being more able to carry on risk, um, more able to allow students to do self-learning. Yeah, it's yeah. really, it's re then it's all, we interviewed faculty, so it's all anecdotal. So we want to delve into that and find out what's going on there because we have some suspicion that that's the kind of learning that students need to have. They need to mm -hmm. be able to, they need to be able to understand and manage real world complexity. They need mm -hmm. to be, un, be able to be stuck in a project that's of significant size and not feel overwhelmed and know where to start and know how to comport themselves professionally. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's really great to hear. Thank you. All right, it's, it's you're on, okay. Greg. I guess I'm next, right? You are next. So I'm at Drexel University. Um, Heidi and I are on the same research team. So the stuff that she talked about is, you know, very much the experience I've had as well. Um, I thought maybe it would be good. Uh, so she, Heidi kind of took it from the student perspective and the fact that students don't understand open source and our talk uh, before the break was about saying, hey, open source world, you have to tell the story of open source because students don't get it. And it's a really great story for attracting people to compete. It is. Um, and, and we need to do more of that as a, as a large community, the whole open source world. Um, but it's also true that faculty don't understand open source. And so we have put a lot of effort in over the years. Heidi mentioned the Posse program, which started out as a Red Hat outreach, outreach effort. And then we started to collaborate with them and took it over. Uh, although Red Hat's still involved, you know, we very often run it uh, in Raleigh in, in the Red Hat facilities. Um, and we, you know, they're, they're great in giving us that kind of support. Um, but but the, the problem we're wrestling with is most faculty don't know how open source works. They're not familiar with the open source world. They don't feel competent to teach open source. And, uh, and we're trying to solve that problem, you know, but it is, it's a large problem in terms of getting open source into universities and getting open source education going. One of the big problems is we have a huge learning curve for the faculty who would teach those courses. Uh, yeah. We get a fair number of faculty that are interested, but um, not nearly enough that have actually been through training like ours or gone and done open source things on their own or come in from industry where they had a career where they did open source. I mean, certainly there are people around that fit all those categories, but it's a relatively small number of people. So we need a lot of effort just to get just to get instructors up to speed on this sort of thing. That um, is, That's going to be years of work into the future. Um, it has all kinds of implications. Heidi touched on the fact that it actually changes the way people teach. You know, almost any active learning approach that you, you adopt tends to change the way people teach if they're used to the old lecture style kind mm -hmm. of teaching. And um, almost by definition, doing a, the kind of open source, open source participation, which is what we're interested in, having students participate in open source project, requires an active learning, requires faculty being willing to let go of the control requires faculty to be co-learners with students instead of sage on the stage, you know, fonts of knowledge in a lecture. Um, all those things happen. And, and we find that the faculty that make that leap love it. You know, we've yeah. done structured interviews with faculty and they'll say things like, oh, open source has reinvigorated my entire teaching. It's yeah. changed the way I think about my job. It's changed the way I interact with my students. So there's, there's wonderful stories there. But um, it's scary for a lot of faculty members, and it's and it's yeah. not easy to make that kind of a change. So. That's how those of us at the start of open source felt about the whole thing. There is the famous story of um, Sam Ruby, who you may have met because he works in the in the Triangle area of for IBM, and um, he was very senior at IBM. I think he's been there now his whole career. So, you know, in the tw the late twenties of years at this point. And he's, he's a senior staff engineer. He's worked for some of the big name VPs that were doing bleeding edge things. But at some point he found Apache in its early days. And he used to say, look, 
I like IBM, but I will quit if they tell me I can't work in Apache anymore. Like it just, it was a sea change for him. Right. And, right. and that's, it is often that way that we find for people. So um, I have been collecting professor stories, which is probably why I got nominated to do moderate this panel for a long time now and um, all over the world because I spent the first 10 years of open source flying around the world trying to legitimize it with governments and companies and universities. And I used to refuse to talk to a government unless they would also find me a university I could talk to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I did it for Sun for six years and then for Intel for four years. And in all that time, I collected a lot of professors and I've seen a lot of attempts and, and approaches to incorporating open source. Um, one of the easiest ones uh, to justify, I think, is which is right under all of our noses, is at San Francisco State University, Samir Verma, Professor Samir Verma, who started out as Associate Professor Samir Verma when I met him, has been working for years on a comprehensive curriculum at both CS and MIS levels. Um, in the MIS department, to, to um, Ellen's thing about needing to teach new skills, he feels like uh, content delivery has to be modernized. So he doesn't let people use Office. He makes them learn Drupal, right? <laughs> he makes them deliver their, their homework on Drupal and they have to stand up a Drupal server to do that with. And, um, and that's an MIS class, right? At, at his CS department classes, he's been very heavily invested in Drupal for a long time. And what that has bought him is all of the university, the whole California university system a California State University system is run on Drupal. And the kids that are the best and brightest from his program get hired right away into the university. So it becomes a virtuous circle. People want to get in the program because they know it leads to a job. And I've seen that pattern repeat itself in other places as well. Um, there's a guy in India that produces open content. And it's not necessarily about programming, although a lot of it is, but there's also how to do better agriculture, how to build a jet a rocket stove for your home, how to, you know, keep from getting malaria. There are lots of the common things. Um, they are simultaneously translated into 22 languages of India by students. And they're built in such a way that these video assets can be reused. Um, and, and that's all an open source project and very interesting. So you can get creative about how you incorporate open source. Those are paid internships all those kids that are working, but more importantly, they're tending to get jobs directly in communication because they have public track record of producing stuff, right? So the, the, the and it leads to a job component seems to be a pretty big um, vector, um, but there are others, there are others. And so now let's get into the, the, the meat of what we'd like to see happen or what we, where we think we're going. So we've heard a little bit about sort of where we're at what is your sort of desired end state for open source in education and how it can help with diversity and inclusion since we're in that panel? Um, I will start with Greg because you got to be last last time. Okay. Um, I, I'm thinking a desire. I mean, we got a lot of little pieces here. One is uh, I, that I have to say is that open source really be integrated in all computing curricula. We are very far from that. So I won't, yeah. I won't delve into that. It's going to take a long time to do that. And, and there are a significant number of places now that touch on open source in a course or maybe even have an open source course. That's where we are at Drexel, actually. Is I, I teach an open source course at Drexel. I really don't think that's the best way. I would much rather see it be integrated across the curriculum as the way students do their work. And that's much harder to do. There are a few schools that are trying that. San Francisco State, I'm not familiar with that. I'm going to go look it up. Yeah, um, I do. That's why but, I mentioned uh, it. <laughs> one, that, one that's closer to one of the other people on our research team uh, is a faculty member from Dickinson College, small liberal arts, selective liberal arts college in Southern Pennsylvania. They came to Posse, small department. They brought the whole department. It's like five faculty members. And they went back and they started to re re redesign their curriculum around open source from, from freshman year through senior year. And I think that's really the way to go. Uh, the other part for the diversity and inclusion is I think we need to tell, I think open source is a great core for telling the story of responsible, positive, society beneficial computing. And there's a broad version of that that covers everybody in open source, pretty much all of open source. You can talk about the kind of things I talked about in the last talk, which is the, 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 um, 
the attitudes, the culture of open source, I think would just be so much better for being an, an inclusive version of computing if people would adopt that as, as the way they think about how computing professionals behave. And then the humanitarian layer that we deal with, I, I, I think that computing as a profession, we're young, right? 50, 60 years old, a little more than that maybe okay. now, um, but relatively young. You know, we don't have, if you look at law, you know, where pro bono work is established, if you look at medicine, where they do a lot of the same sort of thing, we, we try and position computing as a profession. Where's our equivalent? There was computing, computer scientists for professional responsibility. They're out of business, right? That, that organization doesn't exist mm -hmm. anymore. You know, we, we really are missing that society benefit layer as a as both in the profession and in the education for the profession. Every, every program has the ethics course that the students are required to take or computing social responsibility, like one course. Again, I want that to be across the curriculum. And I think open source provides you the right way to talk about something like that. As, as, a, as a lot of positive factors that students should understand and, and internalize as part of their professional identity. Great, yeah, I, I agree with everything you're saying and I can relate to a lot of it too. I wanna to say that people who are typing questions in, Dorothy's got a couple now and I will get to them, I promise. Just keep giving me questions and I will get through them. Okay, um, so now let's, we haven't heard from Ellen in a while. Ellen, do you wanna say something about your desired end state, like if you could stay in the business long enough and be influential enough, where would it go? Uh, I think that everything that Greg said was great. Um, something I'd add is that it can be hard for especially women to participate in open source if they don't have the leisure time, um, if they have a second shift at home. So making open source part of school curricula gives students experience without having making them do an extra burden on top of what they're already doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's and that's really important for underrepresented parties because they tend to also be carrying more load. Right. So, yeah, that, I think that's a really good point. Thank you for that one. How about you got one got any. Yeah, so Heidi. So one of the things that I would really like to see is, as Greg mentioned, open source integrated throughout the curriculum. But I would like to see a lot of the silos in academia broken down, right? We have computer science departments. And there's been some motion towards computing plus X. I would love to have a lab put 10 students in it, two teams of five, business students, students from nutrition, students from computer science, and have them work together on the food pantry project, right? Have the nutritionist come in and be able to give that information about, well, well, if we're going to put together a food basket for people, we need it to be nutritionally balanced. And, and the sociologist about how do you actually deploy, get the food to the students out there? And I think that if we can create something that is um, inter, I don't even like to, I want to say integrated. I don't even want to say interdisciplinary. I want it to be integrated. I think we can create an environment then that is welcoming for all. If we, if we pull down the barriers between the disciplines. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, the best projects have a, a, a type of that. I mean, there are within computer science, we know there are different disciplines as well. There are people that work in the front end, there are people that work in the back end, you know, people that work in the middle. And, um, and all of those teams have to be able to work together as well. So it's not, it, you know, it goes both directions. Um, I have one I, yeah, go ahead, one more. I have one more comment. My experience with students is, I guess what I would like to say is open source projects, you have immense immense leverage because I will have a student that will work an entire semester. And if somebody from the open source community says, good job, it is better than getting an A in the course. It is right. hugely motivating. And I think that too, that sense of community has the ability to draw, to, to level the playing field. Yeah, I think you're right about that. It certainly empowers people who have been historically told that they're different or not measuring up quite right. Um, and of course, those are often the best contributors in open source projects. So, you know, it's, it's I mean, we, we were originally a band of misfit toys that didn't like the way the business was being run, right? 
And since we had the means and the internet existed, we thought we would just, you know, write our own reality. I mean, Richard Stallman being the prime example of that whole thing. So, um, okay, the I was going to talk to you about inner source because you were talking about breaking down silos. So inner source and the inner source commons is something I started while I was at PayPal about five years ago now. We just incorporated as a nonprofit this year, separate from PayPal. And you know, we're doing our own thing right now. And um, we've there's a lot of academics involved in inner source commons. There's been a lot of research, especially under Dirk Riele and also Lero in, in Ireland, um, looking at this trend. But what we're seeing now is a huge rise in interest in inner source in a very interesting place, and that is banks and financial institutions. They have to modernize. They, they have capitalized on an old pattern for about as far as it can go, and they know that. And so they're in a race now to see who can get to the new place fastest, and they seem to be taking up inner source as the way to do that. And we state right up front, inner source is about breaking down your silos, teaching you how to make microservices work for you, teaching you how to value all contributions and build across the organization knowledge that you're, that you're leaving on the floor now because you're allowing too many hallway conversations and not enough asynchronous communication that you can capture and make into an archive, right? So basically saying, look, open source won for a reason, but 85% of the engineers in the world still don't get to use it. And a big part of that is pushing it into schools because um, it's pretty clear that I, in Ireland, we're a hospitality tech regime. That means we don't invent technology so much as we offer homes for it in Europe. And I mean, I'd like to see us become more inventive and that's part of the plan. But um, right now, anybody that's inventive in Ireland ends up going to the US or to the UK because that's where the money is, right? So trying to get trying to break that cycle while simultaneously looking at the way things are done, the way things are taught, the, all of that stuff uh, is kind of where I'm living these days, but I'm trying to apply inner source to that problem. So we did this COVID app. You guys might know that the most popular COVID app and COVID contact tracing app in the world was developed in Ireland. And it has subsequently been picked up by four states in the US. There's some more coming in that vector and then a whole bunch of Europe as well. And we're starting to see contributions to the open source code base that we put together at the Linux Foundation called COVID Green from like New Zealand, picked it up, used it to write their new app, added a feature which they're now giving back to us. So it's becoming the one that won because we did open source for real. And it's been a huge eye opener for the Irish government. They're not used to being in front. They're not used to leading anything. And so they want to know if they can reproduce this and, and they have a real interest. So we've been pushing an initiative through something called MOS Labs, which is, stands for Municipal Open Source Software Labs. MOS Labs is trying to get both academic institutions like Johns Hopkins and um, municipalities, not, not state federal governments, but municipalities to look at adopting open source as a means to create better synergy. And it's a really nice synergy if those two halves happen in the same place. So Johns Hopkins and the city of Baltimore can partner to fix Baltimore, which is beneficial to Johns Hopkins because that's where they pull all of their employees from. But they also are trying to be better about tech transfer. And if they adopt open source means to get their tech transfer out into the public and that lands in Baltimore, then they've done all the good in one swoop, right? So we call that OSPO++ because we're trying to build a network of open source program offices established at the academic and at the um, municipal level. So now we're running around finding all the existing ones. And do you guys know about Santa Cruz? Yes. Yeah, I'm sure. So, so Ellen doesn't. Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz has this thing called CROSS, which is basically an open source program office in their graduate CS department because they had a single graduate who took his work, which they allowed him to open source and founded a famous company using it. So then they came knocking with, you know, hey, we helped you do this. Do you want to give us some money? And he said, I would give you money if you designed something that allowed subsequent grad students to follow this path. And so then with his help, they went to all the tech companies and got co-spending. Co so they're actually a profit center for UC Santa Cruz, the Open Source Institute. So it's possible. Right? 
now they'll be fatigued. Not everybody's going to get that same level of engagement, but um, there's something to do there. And so that's what Moss is interested in. Okay, I'm done doing my thing. We'll go back to your thing. <laughs> I mean, they try. We're trying to be additive, of course. So, um, what do you think the first thing a university should do or a school should do if they wanted to include this kind of curriculum? What's their first step? Anybody, anybody want to answer first? Greg, you look like you might have faculty. One. No. You have to get some faculty engaged. Um, okay. And that can be broad, you know, it, but it certainly has to start there because they tend to be the ones who have to deliver the goods and they tend to be the ones who control the curriculum. It's really clear that you have to stay away from the, the traditional tech transfer people because they will try to kill yes. you. Well, right. So I, I'm a, my Drexel is a research one institution and the tech transfer office at Drexel, they understand open source. It's not their business, you know, but they're like, yeah, OK, we understand that. If something's open source, it's not our turf. Basically, it's, that's their their attitude. Oh, maybe you want to come talk to the um, to the OSPO plus plus people because they're really interested in those examples, and they okay. are still collecting our ones. Sure. So, how about you, Ellen? You got any ideas about where to start? Um, I'd say at Mills, what we do is because a faculty member has participated in open source and is excited about it. So I agree with Greg, it has to start with the faculty. And it's interesting because in Europe, the curriculum is usually influenced most by an external party. It's usually not the faculty that's that's personally able to do that. Although there are plenty of examples of individual professors who buck the trend but it's uphill for them. Heidi, what do you think? I think that um, in addition to that, demonstrating the benefit to the institution. So I, we just got a new president um, in, in August and he really likes our idea of having a local food pantry and it being supported by students. And that helps um, send some resources towards faculty to free them up to be able to make the changes. So I, I think it has to start with faculty, but you have to have some administrative support to give that. Um, and that can require somebody from the outside coming in and pointing out to, to someone at that level, look, this is an important thing that needs to happen. Um, because sometimes faculty pointing that out isn't as effective as one might like. <laughs> I can't imagine how that would happen. <laughs> you still have to live in the work. You still have to work there, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah yeah I'll, how about I'll put that, in a bit I'll put in a pitch for industry people too you know it, one of the things that gives credibility to open source among our students Drexel is an unusual school in that um, in the computing area across the university almost all of our students do co-op so over the they, they're with us for five years and they spend a year and a half in industry during right. that time and and I hear yeah, from them over and over again too, right? what's that Woodridge does that too right uh, don't they don't mostly know. they mostly go to to microsoft that canadian okay. school anyway yeah. yeah um so what i hear from my students over and over again is they go out on co-op after doing something open source with us and the industry people are really interested in it and and a yeah. lot of times it relates to a sort of an inner source perspective exactly what you were talking about before that they're trying to adopt things you know, process things and, and um, cultural things from open source, and they don't right. quite know how to do it. So they get a student who's done some stuff with open source communities and, and they love it. They're really interested in it. And that gives a credibility that flows back into the institution among the students. Yeah, that's one of the pieces of research that we're trying to get Lero to do is to um, prove that the hospitality tenants of Irish soil would like more collaboration in the workforce that's offered to them indigenously because right. right now there's nothing in the curriculum that, that, that except for you know a few pirate things right. so yeah that's that's super cool um okay how about this diversity question so um i am a woman my degrees in french literature i was the cto of wikipedia i did that through tech um and open source right uh, but I'm also uh, I, I'm also able to handle criticism, and um, you know I was able to work through the time when I there were only two women in the room ever, and that was a that was a good day, you know, and and all that stuff's getting better now. Um, but there's also a whole new crop of students who have different expectations. So 
um, tell me about what you think the potential is for diversity and whether uh, open source is really a vector for it. Is anybody coming up with something? I don't want to call on people that aren't ready to talk to me. I mean, in in theory, it should be it should be a no brainer, right? Because on the internet, nobody cares who you are. And I do know of at least two famous stories. You guys probably know about Aaron Schwartz when he first showed up um, working on XML. He was this great contributor. Everybody was super happy to see him. They were getting ready for a conference, and they said, "Hey, are you? Can you come to the conference?" And he said, "I'll have to ask my mom." And they said, "Why is that?" And he said, "Because I'm 13." You know, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Sebastian Dezalis, same thing at Red Hat. Yeah, working in Fedora. Yeah, um, I think I, I continue to think that it, the answer that as we build receptive communities in in FOSS, that that will um, that that will allow us to more easily migrate students into there. Um, I have this, you're getting just my opinion now. <laughs> but That's I all good. That's what we're here for. <laughs> I have observed my students are remarkably open. My students I, I are, they will discuss diversity related issues in ways that we never would have thought to discuss and are remarkably accepting of their peers. Um, so if we can create I, again, I go back to that pipeline. How do we how do we make the connection so that we can get students connected with the communities? If we can get them connected with the right communities, I think we could significantly diversify. Having said that, we got to get we got to do better at diversifying the front end of the pipeline. We got to get better at getting a larger group of students in the door. Mm, that's, right. a that's a tough issue. So um, I want to. Make a comment and tie it to a comment that was made in the chat about um, open source in social sciences, environmental, biological sciences. Yeah, thank you so for on. that. Um, I think that is really important because I think the sort of thing that which has come up multiple places in the conversation today um, that a lot of women come into tech sideways. Um, we, we need to do everything we can to get them in the front door and have them, you know, start in computing degrees and go right through. But that's a long, that's a long process for us to be successful at. I think we need to also do everything we can to make it make it easier and, and more likely that they'll come in through the side door in greater numbers than they have in the past. And, uh, and I think the introducing open source in these other areas is one of the ways that you can do that, you know, you can try and grab because where do the girls go, you know, the girls that are interested in science not overwhelmingly, but more than anywhere else, they go to biology. <laughs> right. So if we could biology do something with those when right, I was a kid. environmental science, biological sciences, we could get open source in there as well uh, and tell that story right. You know, that here's a kind of computing that is community-based, that has different kinds of values, that has inherent values to society like transparency and some of the other things that, that we talked about earlier. That, that that message being delivered to students who aren't computing students, but they're in these other majors where the, where the tech oriented or, or um, science oriented engineering oriented girls tend to go, that could be a, a big help in getting them to, to say, oh, I really should move that way. And maybe they don't do it before they graduate, but in their careers, you know, it'll give them cool. a different thought about how to move into computing or what it would mean to move into computing. So that's one piece. Yeah, can, no, I say, can I add one more? Yeah, um, of course. More women, in, in front facing positions in open source projects. You know, yeah, that we, is just we've so been pushing important. for that for so long. Yeah. But some of the best ones, man, I don't know if you've ever met Angie Byron, if you know about her, but she is, um, she's such a star. She's, she's a community manager for Drupal. And um, she, she herself is a queer woman and she is, that's important because she treats everybody the same uh, who comes to the door without any pre-screening of, you know, what's their level of, uh, you know, how, are they beginners or experts? Are they, are they, you know, what color are they? Any of that stuff. Everybody gets the same beautiful, lovely humanist appeal from Angie and they've made it cool between her and Dries. They've made it cool to be that way. So there's very little friction in that community. 
of the and type that that pushes women out. Sometimes. When you said she treats everyone the same, that made me think of what some of the worst people say that, you know, yeah, they're terrible to women, they're terrible to everyone. So I'm glad yeah, yeah, that's, that's not where you were going. No, 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 no. She's great. And and yes, that other thing used to be the norm. But you know, I, you had asked me five years ago, if they would ever actually get Richard to step down, I would have said no. But that happened. It's kind of amazing. And or or Linus to behave. Well, Linus, that was a different story, right? That that my understanding is that that was like an internal to his family thing that made him realize it was time to change. Like his wife, we can thank his wife for that. I I hadn't heard that, but I know pressure was also put on the sponsors. Well, right. I mean, they had hired people to as front ends for him. You know, there was a lot of overhead to, to making that work, but but he has found another gear. I think he's probably a happier dude now. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay, so let me just say one more thing. Uh, we did not talk about this topic that Dorothy queued up of the perception of different levels by which I think she means hierarchy. Like, are you a beginner? Are you an expert? Are you, I kind of talked right. that talked about that a little bit, but how do you talk to students about that or help them understand that? So, so my approach is to convince them that everybody's a beginner, you know, and, and, and most many of the faculty who have, we know that have gotten engaged in open source adopt this co-learning model, which, which where, where they try and change students, make students understand they don't have all the answers, but they're better at finding answers than the students are. And so the class becomes about how do you find answers, not I know and you don't. You know, and, uh, which and is so, why you know so much about Stack Overflow. <laughs> right, exactly. And, yeah. um, and, and, and I think there's got to be a change in what faculty model in terms of who they are and what they're about and what the students are about um, and that open source is a natural for. Uh, so I think that would be part of the answer. Um, this may also have to do with different levels of open source in terms of how technical we're talking about. You know, whether we're talking about just being a user of open source, whether we're talking about being a contributor to open source, and there's different kinds of contributors. Uh, you, there certainly is a hierarchy there that you can lead students down. And less technical students can do certain parts of things, but not all of it. They can certainly be the users. They can probably be contributors in the sense of reporting issues, requesting features, those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, so that may be what, what we have in mind here as well. A well-organized open source project, people can come in at a relatively non-technical level and really make good contributions. And some of the really famous projects have gone to a lot of trouble now. Um, if you go to look at LibreOffice and the way that they reorganize that open office code base, you can actually do discrete research into when a bug was introduced in a build because they build on a regular basis. And you can, as a relatively inexperienced coder in the scene, you can do that research, which is time consuming and help the engineer that's going to be able to make the critical fix figure out where it is very quickly because of the way that they've documented everything. So it's, yeah, they, we're finding new ways to make it easier all the time. Anyway, I, we should wrap up. I really want to thank all of you for the work that you do out there, helping students figure it out. And I feel like we should be creating an association of people that do this so that there's better sharing because I told you about some folks you didn't know and you told me about some stuff right. I didn't know and I've been doing this full time for 21 years so that's, that implies that there's room for more synergy between us all you know right absolutely so um if I could ask at least one of you to show up at the Oslo plus plus stuff I'm happy to tell you how to get to that working group um that might be the way that it happens because there's such a focus on academia there right now okay Okay, and um, does great. anybody else have anything they want to say in closing, Ellen? No, are you happy? Did you did you have a good time? Good, everybody good? I hope you this get a chance This has been great fun, come. yeah. Thank you, I hope you get a chance to come to All Things Open in, in person sometime. It, the reason that we like it so much is because it is a lovely community. There's a lovely atmosphere of, of decorum and politeness and sharing and fun in this community and it's also the fastest growing open source uh, right. conference in the world i think they were doubling every year for the first five years that they did it they're up around four or five thousand people when they do it in person 
that show up right. and stay the whole time. So it's pretty exciting. Yes, it is. Anyway, yeah, thank you so much. I'm quite yeah. sure this will be a really popular panel back in the, when it, when it makes it into the video sphere. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you, Denise, okay. appreciate it. Thank you again. Thank you all.